a classic response, a classic critique of relevance realization is why don't we spend all of our lives in video games, right? <laughs> like I'm super tuned in to what's relevant. And John has a nice framework here. You know, the, uh, the, um, the video game is normatively viable. It, you know, I know exactly what I need to do. It's descriptively viable. There's no ambiguity. Like everything's really very clearly in front of me. The rules I need to follow. So why is it clearly quite bad to spend your whole life in video games? And the point, really, what active inference gives you, and I think this is really the nice convergence of active inference and predictive processing, which is what John, oh, sorry, uh, no, active inference and relevance realization. Although John will say predictive processing and relevance realization. We can get into that distinction. Um, what it gives you is a kind of a, an explanation for why being in video games the whole time is bad for you. And the point being is that you, Jack, me, Darius, like us as human beings are composed of bundles of embedded Markov blankets, embedded systems that are trying to minimize free energy. What does that mean? Well, there's obviously going to be a subset of those systems that are doing very well at minimizing variational free energy and having a great time while you're playing your video game. But you've, you, in some ways, the, the many ways, the psychopathology is thinking that that's enough, right? That that's going to fulfill all of the variational free energy requirements that exist right up the embedded Markov blanket chain. And the point being is that if I played video games for 12 hours, I would need to piss, I would need to eat, I would need to sleep, and you are not providing evidence for any of those prior expectations. So there was a, a very old critique, I mean old because active, it's not actually old, but active inference is very new, so old relative to the, the time that active inference has been around is this dark room problem. The dark room problem is basically the idea is if all we want to do is minimize prediction error, why don't we just go sit in pitch black rooms and do nothing, right? Like, I will get no prediction error, the world won't be changing, it'll be fantastic. But it's, so, it's such, actually such an easy problem to skirt because that's not the case, right? Like, what about my food? What about my food requirements? What about my sleep requirements? What about my first requirements? What about my social requirements? And then the more you add those requirements, those expectations that make us the things that we are, you know what you end up getting? You end up getting a society, a culture, you end up getting your own life. So, like, we're quite elegantly coupled to our environment. Our environment, this is this idea of an eco-niche. We've shaped our environment so that it's predictable. And by predictable, I mean it maximizes our model evidence, right? It allows us to maximize our model evidence. It allows us to uh, exploit the affordances that are in the environment. Right? We've shaped it culturally so that it will do that, such that, and, like, a really a harmonious culture or agent arena relationship is one where, the culture is giving me everything for my entire generative model, including all the levels of my Markov blankets. Again, a, lot, a culture that was only giving you video games will have a really hard time fulfilling all of those needs. So I think there's something to be said about well-being being coherent all the way up the generative hierarchy. And this is something that I'm, this is something that I've written on uh, with Libby Severs. Uh, we wrote this paper on Tourette's and this idea that I had called oppositional phenomenal self-modeling, which is in something like Tourette's or OCD or really a number of psychopathologies, you might have, uh, you know, for example, if I tick, if I do a ticking behavior with someone with Tourette's, I'm kind of fulfilling uh, a prediction at a very low level motor arc, but I'm also negating evidence for this kind of higher order expectation that I'm a social being, I don't want to tick, right? I'm not a ticking thing. And so you see this kind of tension, which has led me to think, and I think I've, you know, I'll be writing some stuff with some people about this, um, is that, maybe something like well-being is actually coherent all the way up the generative hierarchy such that the very low-level motor system and the very high-level conceptual system are working in concert with one another.